Welcome to our first daily revision booster for the paper twos. So the way these are going to work then is I've looked at the comments that you've left on the video about the things that you really want to go through. And each day over half term, then I'm going to put up a new video that's going to go through one of the biology, one of the chemistry and one of the physics topics that you've requested. So if there are any others that you want to put in there, then by all means, put the requests up so I can do that. And I'll also include a daily formula for you just to remind you of those two. First thing then is our daily formula. So today we're looking at wave speed, which has the units of meters per second. And to work it out, you do the frequency in Hertz times the wavelength in meters. Today's biology blast then is going to be looking at genetic engineering. So when we're talking about genetic engineering, we're actually referring to the process where we alter an organism's genome by selecting genes to create a certain characteristic. So what we're actually doing is changing both the genotype and the phenotype of the organism. And there's three kind of key examples you should know of genetically engineered organisms that we use currently. First of all, we've got genetically engineered cotton, and we do that to increase the crop yield. Secondly, we've got genetically engineered corn, and that's going to produce toxins to kill the insects that would normally damage the crop. And thirdly, we can genetically engineer bacteria so that the bacterial cells produce drugs that are useful to us as humans, like human insulin. The way we actually do this then is that we first of all identify a gene that shows the desired characteristic. So what we want to then show in our future organism. We then take those foreign genes from one organism that shows that characteristic and we insert them into the plant or animal cells at a really early stage of their development. Because that means that then every cell that comes after that is also going to have those genes present in its genome. So it's going to produce that protein or that particular characteristic throughout all of those cells. If you're doing GCSE biology, then you also need to know some of the risks associated with genetic engineering. Now, the key thing here is that we don't know the long term effects. We haven't actually had this technology for that long in reality. So we don't know what using genetically engineered organisms over a long period of time may be. So some of the possible negative effects that people have suggested are health problems because we could introduce new allergens to our food supply that aren't there naturally. We could also potentially see cross pollination with the wild plants. And that means that the wild plants could show characteristics that wouldn't occur naturally. And therefore we can disrupt the balance of our ecosystem. The last thing we could point out as a potential downside to our genetic engineering is that ethical issue. And some people believe that the whole thing is unethical because we're actually interfering with nature. We as humans are deciding to change things and manipulate them for our own particular preference. For those of you who are doing either higher tier combined or higher tier GCSE biology, then you need to know a little bit more about how we produce these genetically engineered organisms. And basically there are three key steps. First one is we need to identify the genes that code for that desired characteristic. Second is that we remove the gene from the donor organism. And the third is we're going to insert that gene into the host organism. Obviously, if they give you a higher mark question on this particular topic, then you're going to need to go into a bit more detail than just those three basic steps. So in the diagram at the bottom, you can see all of the detail that you could possibly be asked for on anything up to a six mark question on this. So we start off by identifying the gene that codes for our desired characteristic, and then we need to remove that gene from the donor organism. So the way we do that is by using a special kind of enzyme called a restriction enzyme. So you can see in the top of the diagram there, we're removing the human insulin gene from the DNA by using a restriction enzyme to cut it. Now, what we also do is we remove a plasmid from our bacterial cell, which is going to be our host at the end. And we use the same restriction enzymes that we cut our DNA with the insulin gene. We use those same restriction enzymes to cut the plasmid. 
Now, the reason we do that is because it's going to give you the exact same base sequence at that cut point. So it gives us something called sticky ends so that when we actually mix together the gene of our human insulin from the human DNA and the bacterial plasmid, then the two exposed ends are complementary to each other. So that means they're going to stick together and then we join that using an enzyme called DNA ligase. So restriction enzymes cut it, DNA ligase joins it together. Once we've then done that, all we do is we insert the plasmid into our host bacterium and then we allow that bacteria to replicate. As we know, bacteria replicate through binary fission, so they're going to divide and create the identical genetic copies, so the clones, and then we end up with an entire vat full of these transgenic bacteria, all of which are going to be producing the human insulin for us. So make sure you do remember those key facts there. Restriction enzymes are going to be used to cut our gene and our plasmid, and DNA ligase is going to join them together. As we've just said, we've got two key enzymes that we need to remember when we're talking about producing these genetically engineered organisms. The first, the restriction enzymes, are the ones we're using to cut the donor DNA at those specific base sequences to create the sticky ends. And we use that same restriction enzyme to cut the bacterial plasmid to create the complementary sticky ends. So just remember that we must use the identical restriction enzyme in those two scenarios. The second enzyme we use, the ligase enzyme, that's the one that joins the sticky ends through forming a bond between them. So what we then find is that we can create complementary base pairing through the action of another enzyme whose name you don't actually need to know at this point. So just remember the name, restriction enzyme is the cutter, ligase enzyme is going to join the sticky ends by the formation of a bond. So one of the things we need to do before we actually just let these bacteria grow is we need to check that the gene has actually been successfully transferred. And there's a couple of ways that we can do this. But to all intents and purposes, what we're doing is using something called a marker gene. So the two ways that we can use a marker gene is either by an antibiotic resistance gene or a fluorescence gene. So the process is pretty similar, but I'm going to take you through each in turn. If we use an antibiotic resistance gene as our marker gene, then we insert our antibiotic resistance gene into the plasmid at the same time as the gene for our desired characteristic. We then take those bacteria and transfer them onto an agar plate that contains the antibiotic that the gene is resistant to. You incubate it, allow it time to grow, and then any of the colonies that are present on that agar plate will have the genes because we assume that if they've got the antibiotic resistance gene, then they've also got our desired characteristic gene. So you can just select those colonies and allow them to replicate in large numbers. If we're using a fluorescence gene instead as our marker, then again, we do the same thing. We insert our fluorescent marker gene into the plasmid at the same time as our desired characteristic gene. We transfer those bacteria onto an agar plate again. We incubate it, a given time to grow. And then in order to check these results, what we do is we shine an ultraviolet light onto the plate. Any of those colonies that then glow, they've got the genes. So we can select those and allow them to replicate in large numbers. Obviously, the key idea behind this whole use of a marker gene is to allow us to then only grow the particular bacteria that have got the desired characteristic gene. Otherwise, if we didn't have that checking stage, we could produce large numbers of bacteria that hadn't actually taken up the gene and it'd be pretty useless to us. So we select the colonies with the desired gene and then build up large numbers of those transgenic bacteria that will all have the right gene in them. Quick reminder before we go on to our chemistry that wave speed in meters per second is the frequency in hertz times the wavelength in meters. Today's chemistry check is one for just those of you doing GCSE chemistry. We're going to be focusing on one of those topics from C6, which is the alkanes. First point is what is a hydrocarbon? This is hopefully a definition you know. It always used to be a favourite for a couple of marks. 
So hydrocarbons are compounds made from hydrogen and carbon only. Now that word only is important, so make sure you include it. When we're talking about alkanes, then these are a variety of hydrocarbon. And what they do is they form what's called a homologous series because they've got certain features in common. They share the same general formula and they're all saturated. And when something is saturated, that means that they only have single bonds between the atoms. There are no double bonds, only single bonds. One of the things you need to be able to do here then is name the first four straight chain alkanes. Now, the good news is that naming chemicals is quite a logical process. So to name the first four, we need to first of all learn the prefix, so the first part of the name. And that quite simply just tells us how many carbon atoms there are. So if we've got one carbon atom, it's meth, two is eth, three prop, four but. So as long as you remember the number of carbon atoms with those prefixes, then you've got the first part of many different chemical names. In order to get the ending, because these are alkanes, then all you do is add the ending ane to whichever prefix it was. So if we had a three carbon atom alkane, it would be propane. If it was a two carbon atom, it would be ethane. So we mentioned the fact that our alkanes are in a homologous series because they've got the same general formula. You do need to know this general formula in order to work out the chemical formula of any alkane they give you. And quite simply, the general formula is CN H2N plus two. You can see it at the bottom there. So if they tell you that you've got an alkane with four carbon atoms and ask you to work out the formula for it, all you do is C4 and then you do two times four is eight plus two is 10, so H10. So you can work out any alkane at all if you know that general formula. The other thing you need to be able to do with our alkanes is draw the displayed formula of those first four straight chain alkanes. Now, this is easy to do if you remember two rules. One is that carbon atoms will form four covalent bonds. And the second is that hydrogen atoms form one covalent bond. So when you come to draw the displayed formula, you always put the carbon atoms in a line, first of all, in the middle join those with their individual bonds because it's an alkane it's only a single bond and then all you've got to do is add hydrogens around the outside making sure that every carbon atom has four bonds and every hydrogen only one so it's a really easy way that you can do that and i've given you propane as the example there but whichever one they asked you to draw carbons along the middle first of all then you can add all your lines and then add the hydrogens last of all do a quick count at the end to make sure with the general formula, you've got the right number of each. The last thing we need to know about our alkanes then is what happens when we burn them. And what we end up with are one of two outcomes here. We will either have complete combustion, which is where we have complete oxidation of our hydrocarbon and then form only two products, carbon dioxide and water. So you can see in the bottom left, our general word equation, hydrocarbon plus oxygen makes carbon dioxide and water. If they ask you to write a word equation for it, all you'd need to do is change the word hydrocarbon to whatever alkane it was. The other option is incomplete combustion, which is what's gonna happen when we don't have enough oxygen present to carry out the complete oxidation of our hydrocarbon. And as a result of incomplete combustion, we end up with three products, carbon, carbon monoxide and water. So again, I've given you the general word equation at the bottom. All you need to do is change the word hydrocarbon to whatever alkane they've given you to get it right. They could potentially ask you to write a balanced symbol equation for these, and they will give you your hydrocarbon in all likelihood. Hopefully you remember oxygen is O2, carbon dioxide, CO2, water, H2O, carbon monoxide is CO, just one oxygen there, and carbon, just C on its own. As soon as you've got that, then you can work through balancing as usual to get it. But remember, if it's a two mark balancing question, then you get your first mark just for writing the chemical formulas. 
So even if your balancing goes wrong or you're not confident of balancing, you can still write the chemical formulas to get one of those two marks. Quick reminder, our daily formula today is wave speed in meters per second is the frequency in hertz times the wavelength in meters. For today's physics prep, what we're going to do is have a look at half-life. Now, when we're thinking about half-life, this is looking at what's happening when we have radioactive decay. So hopefully we do remember that radiation is something that's emitted at random. And if we want to measure the amount of radiation that's being emitted, we can use a bit of equipment called a Geiger counter, because that's actually measuring something called the activity. So that's the radiation being emitted per second and has the units of Becquerel's, which has BQ as its units there. When we're talking about half-life, Quite simply, it's the time it takes for the activity to halve. So that just means it's how long it's taking for half of those unstable nuclei to undergo the process of decay. And what we find is, depending on what material we have, that half-life could either be really, really long, as in thousands of years, or incredibly short, as in fractions of a second. So different materials have different half-lives, but the half-life itself is just how long it takes for the activity to reduce by half. For those of you doing the higher tier, you do need to know how we can calculate half-life. And there's two ways we're gonna look at doing this. The first one is from a graph. So your half-life graph is in the middle there. You could be asked to draw one. It may give you one and just ask you to work it out. If they give you the graph, then what you've got is your original activity is the one in the very top left where it's touching your y-axis. So that's your original activity. So all you need to do is look at that to start off with. At time zero, find out what the activity is. Then divide that number by two, come down on the y-axis to where it is, and then use a ruler to go across to the actual curve, and then take it down to your x-axis. Wherever it intercepts your x-axis, then that tells you the half-life. So do go careful when doing this. Number one, make sure you're using a ruler. Secondly, make sure that you have lined it up so it is straight and actually draw those pencil lines on to help you out. Check it twice when you do it because it is really easy to have your ruler a little bit wonky, but that should be a nice, easy way to work out the half-life. The other way you can calculate half-life is by a mathematical calculation. So if we have a question, much like the one I've given you here, a sample of radon-222 has an activity of 100 becquerels, calculate the activity after 11.4 days. The half-life of radon-222 is 3.8 days. The first thing you need to do is work out how many half-lives it goes through in those 11.4 days. So we know that the half-life is 3.8 days and it's going to be running for 11.4. So 11.4 divided by 3.8 tells us it has three half-lives. And we then need to use this to calculate the new activity. So we know it halves three times. So a half times a half times a half is an eighth. And then we just do our original activity of 100 times an eighth, which gives us 12.5. If you're not confident with fractions, and I know not all of you are, then you can take your original half-life of 100 divide it by two, divide that by two, and divide it by two a third time to get that same answer. So just do it the way that works for you in the exam. It doesn't really matter how you get that answer, either using fractions or by dividing it by two multiple times, but just go careful that if you're doing the divide by two method, that you keep a little kind of tally to make sure you don't go wrong and do it too many or too few times. Hopefully at the end of this daily booster, you can now explain genetic engineering in a little bit more detail. You can recall those key facts about alkanes, how to draw them and how to name them. And you can also explain what half-life is and how to calculate it. Remember to join us again tomorrow for our next daily booster for paper two. And if there are any other topics that you are desperate to go through prior to the live streams, post a comment and I'll see what I can do.